So let's start with PCOS, which is a really common condition. In fact, the most common condition, most common reproductive um, condition of women who are premenopausal. So the frequency is probably something between 6, to six and 15% of reproductive age women. A really common condition, might present in all sorts of ways. So you will have patients in your practice that you have no idea about that have PCOS. Patients might present to someone like me and Megan with some um, subfertility or with androgen excess symptoms. Uh, they might have been in hospital with pelvic pain. And remember, PCOS never causes pelvic pain. So very important to emphasize that to your patients, but they might have had a scan that then picked up the little follicles. All sorts of all sorts of ways. Very common in Auckland. Um, I have a, quite a large group of um, of patients who uh, perhaps come to New Zealand, get married. So, for instance, a very very common group is you know would be my Fijian Indian women who are very petite. Um, they work on sugarcane farms when they live in Fiji. The bus service is pretty unreliable, so they tend to be fit and lean and weigh about 45 kilograms. They come to New Zealand, they're very happy, they're more, much more sedentary, they have access to a car, they go to 60 kilograms. We don't, 60 kilograms for Caucasian women is sort of neither here nor there, so we don't tend to think about that. And that patient has put on 15 kilograms of weight and therefore 15 kilograms of insulin resistance and the previously clinically undiagnosed, the clinically asymptomatic PCOS suddenly becomes obvious and everybody's there in your surgery in tears saying we can't have a baby. So all sorts of different presentations. Now today what I wanted to do, and this is a very big topic, I wouldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't normally try and manage all of PCOS in one sort of 40 minute presentation. So I, apologies if I've skipped over things and again just ask me at the end or, or at lunchtime. I did want to um, make you aware of new guidelines that are available and of course you can all look at guidelines and I invite my patients to read the guidelines or the summary and see if I'm managing them appropriately. So today we're going to have a very quick look, I promise you I'm not going to bore you with endocrine, um, I, I mean if we knew the cause of PCOS, um, it, which we don't, um, so I'm not going to bore you much with that. We're going to look at these new guidelines just briefly, key findings, because there are a few changes that might be novel and are perhaps novel to us as well. Use a couple of clinical cases to illustrate PCOS management strategies, remembering that I am going to have to touch over lightly some of these areas just to get through in time. So just to remind you, that there are probably a multiplicity of factors which can lead to the classical hormonal changes. So it, you've got a hormonal milieu which is not estrogen deficient as we've been talking about in Megan's presentation. Plenty of estrogen but too much in the way of both androgenic hormones of which testosterone is the most powerful androgen and too much insulin. But our ability to measure those in clinical practice is actually relatively limited. So what you measure and what might be actually ha happening physiologically could be discrepant. The combination of this means that you get increased follicle atresia. So what you see on that pelvic ultrasound, if you get a good quality scan, is follicles that were present and tried to develop but then didn't progress to ovulation. So atretic follicles. And because of the androgens, you have the androgen excess symptoms, generally persistent acne, some hirsutism, maybe female pattern hair loss, the menstrual disturbances, but really importantly, being aware that this is more than just a gynecological condition. This is a condition that has really quite significant metabolic overtones. And you in primary care must be aware of that in terms of recognizing the condition and managing it. Of course, the whole thing is compounded by the fact that we're all getting fatter. And it, we are, New Zealand is actually, we're a very fat nation. And it seems that that certainly exacerbates the condition and may even contribute to etiology. New perhaps, perhaps something you may, may not be quite so aware about is awareness that there are a lot of psychosocial issues, that the quality of life of a PCOS woman may be seriously impacted by some of these symptoms, and it is important to ask about them, and there is almost certainly a greater degree of anxiety and low mood. So these are issues again, given that you in primary care are the, are the key people who are going to manage low mood and anxiety anyway, you need to be aware that this is a group of women that may have problems in that area. All right, so just summing up, polygenic syndrome, there isn't one gene or one cause, polygenic and environmental factors are really important.
Now, next issue is the lack of clarity about diagnosis. It would be just so simple if it was like diabetes and you had a blood test and you had it or you didn't have it. Not only that, we've had different diagnostic criteria depending on where you are in the world. So you have to, as our patients are very travelled, you have to make people aware that a diagnosis in Australasia may be different from a diagnosis that is reached or not reached in Europe or in North America. So, there are three definitions of PCOS that are currently being floated around. So again, if you're looking at any literature or you're doing any research yourself, you have to be aware of that. So the initial diagnosis was the North American diagnosis, which all focused around <laughs> the clinical signs. You know, if you like the hallmarks of PCOS where you have androgen excess, clinically or biochemically or both, and you have dodgy periods. And that sort of makes sense. And very interestingly, the scan, the, the PCO morphology is not part of the diagnosis in that um, NIH consensus. It turns out there's a political reason that you don't, in the North Americans don't get funded for doing pelvic ultrasound. <laughs> so it's not nearly as developed as it is in Europe and Australasia. Now, then we came to the Rotterdam consensus. And in fact, this is the one we should focus on and the new guidelines have emphasized, this is the one to use. So they look at all, these three criteria, the androgen excess, the irregular or absent periods, and pelvic ultrasound findings. And of course, this means you've got to have availability of good quality ultrasound, and not all of you will be in that position. So in this setting, you have to make sure you haven't got anything else that could mimic it, and I'll come back to it. We'd call that a secondary PCOS picture. But you don't want to miss the occasional patient with an ovarian or adrenal tumour, or a patient who's got a prolactinoma, or got Cushing's, who could just look otherwise like a PCOS patient. And, and I think probably for us, as specialist reproductive endocrinologists, we're the ones who are perhaps more likely to miss it because we see so much primary PCOS. So most people are primary PCOS, but the odd patient might have another underlying cause which would lead you to go down a different pathway. So in this setting with the three criteria, if you can say yes to two of them, so two out of the three, and you've excluded other things, you've got the diagnosis. But of course, that's tricky because you might have a patient who's got absolutely regular periods if they've got the morphology and the androgen excess. Or they've got a positive scan and oligomenorrhea, but no androgen excess. And there are people in the world, particularly the PCOS Society, who have really struggled with that because they've said, this is not the hallmarks of PCOS. In our view, there's this great big spectrum. And when you, those of us who are older in the room, when PCOS was first recognised in the 1940s and we thought about PCOS, we thought about that far end of the spectrum where you had a really a large infertile woman who was extremely hirsute and had no periods. That, that extreme is much less common these days when we're all getting better at recognising it. And we're also recognising that there's a lean phenotype as well as an overweight phenotype. So, you know, we're, we're, we're moving down the spectrum, and my view is we've got a spectrum, and your patients will present at all points in the spectrum. Now, next thing is to ask the question is, why on earth does it matter? And I think it does matter. And just quite simple things, that women want to know why they're still getting acne when they've moved out of their teens. They, they find it very trying, particularly women who are perhaps in their 30s and 40s. The excessive body hair can be very miserable. I, I mean, some of our patients really do worry that they're turning into a male, you know, and I think it's, it's important to address the issues. We've alluded to this being a condition that's got metabolic overtones, and if any of you are not aware of this and the risk of diabetes with PCOS, it's time to update. So it's more than just periods, fertility, um, cosmetic issues, it is a condition that has these very strong metabolic overtones, even a patient who is relatively lean, but particularly the patient who's carrying some excess weight or put on weight and who might have a family history of cardiovascular disease and or diabetes. And that is a patient who needs quite a lot of involvement and management. And then these, perhaps these newer findings that there are psychosocial issues there are, of course, fertility issues in an actually a minority of patients. We'll come back to that. We now recognise that this is not, these women don't have a safer pregnancies and as good a neonatal outcome. And we've always known, but not perhaps always focused, 
um, on the risk of endometrial cancer. And Megan and I see, see ni- overweight 19-year-olds with PCOS and endometrial cancer. So you must consider the endometrium. And I think, in fact, primary care are good at this. And in fact, some of the worst are our colleagues in endocrinology who aren't reproductively focused. So there is that issue, certainly in Auckland, of a little bit of discrepancy of advice. But the risk of endometrial cancer is increased. And if a patient's overweight, it's further increased. And you need to think about the endometrium. Sorry. Um, Do PCOS women slip through the health care cracks? They absolutely do with late diagnosis, the difficulty of knowing the difference between normal puberty and overlap into PCOS. Um, The problem is that we haven't got this one yay or nay diagnosis, that there's been different ways of making the diagnosis. And because, (coughs) and and I think this is really important, you know, women may present to multiple healthcare um, uh, providers, and this is where primary care, again, had the opportunity to put it all together. Okay, so I think pay a big role there. Now, why have we got a new guideline? After we have had Australian guidelines, and we've had guidelines from the um, uh, the Clinical Society of Endocrinologists and the North American Endocrine Society. Now, I think the reason is that we've needed to have buy-in for, for diagnosis and management from lots of different countries. You know, we've had to have international buy-in, and there's been much more evidence coming out with surveys, particularly from the Australians who have been very strong in this area, asking women and with this condition, what they think about their diagnosis and management. And very strongly, there's been the comments about delayed diagnosis and dissatisfaction with care. So I think, I think guidelines that involve consumers and multidisciplinary input as opposed to just endocrinology or, or gynecology input has been very, very important. And this is the reference if you want to look at it or perhaps even look at the summary. Helena Tade, who's my colleague from Melbourne, um, publishing in Fertility and Sterility uh, August last year. And there's various comments. Um, so I've, I've emphasised the, the, the um, difference in these guidelines. I think this was a very noble group who got together, didn't get funded at all, so conflicts of interest were limited. Lots of countries involved, lots of different special societies. So not again, just not just endocrinology, gynaecology, but psychologists, nutritionists, sports physiologists, primary care, consumers. You know, lots of lots of different people who've got who may see this see this condition. Rotterdam diagnostic criteria, which I covered with you and I think you'll all be familiar with, has been widely adopted as the criteria for adult PCOS. Um, And what it does is provide an international evidence-based recommendations. Not only that, the guidelines have been supported by ways of getting this back into clinical care, which I think is important. So, summary of, it's a very long document, I've actually been reviewing it for our group and it's actually been hard work and it's taken a a few late nights. Um, There are a lot of recommendations, interestingly out of 166, only 31 are supported by evidence. So what it means is we don't have great evidence and there's lots of opportunity And, and, and in fact PCOS in primary care would be a wonderful topic to research because when we research it we're seeing a very we're only seeing the group that get referred to specialist care, you know, which is, is you know, so it's a very specialised group that you're investigating. Um, so there were clinical consensus recommendations and lots of clinical practice points. And I think what that also means is there'll be more guidelines to come. So just, just to go through this, Rotterdam consensus for adults, we've covered how to do that, um, and made the point for those of you particularly who don't have access to good quality ultrasound. If you've got the other Rotterdam criteria, you don't actually need to do a pelvic ultrasound. There may be other reasons that you might do a pelvic ultrasound. I'll come to that. Now, interestingly for adolescents, we've we've gone in circles. We were late to diagnose in adolescence. Then we have all told you that you must diagnose this early. Now we're recognizing, as I mentioned to you in the earlier presentation, that PCOS or PCO morphology in adolescence is incredibly common and non-specific. So what we're tending to say is that in adolescence you need more of the criteria and you perhaps might be suspicious of the diagnosis but don't use the ultrasound in this setting. Think about the clinical hallmarks and perhaps be prepared to manage and come back to to confirm the diagnosis. Um, 
We've talked a little bit already this morning about different ultrasound criteria with better quality uh, ultrasound transducers. AMH, anti-malarian hormone, is not yet the answer, even if you've got access to it. And again, emphasizing the importance of insulin resistance as, as it's an important modulator of metabolic consequences, but they're advising against trying to measure insulin levels. You know, so so in Auckland, you know, even we are not allowed to measure insulin or do, you know, because it's considered that we know that this is happening in the patient. It's not particularly helpful to try and measure insulin, and it's difficult to measure insulin. You've got to have very set um, uh, physiological circumstances. So recommendations from the guidelines concerning management. Now, initial steps, once you've got your diagnosis, um, so this is, again, I think really important for primary care. Yes, you're going to worry about the cosmetic features. Patients are most likely to come to you because of periods or the cosmetic issues. But you need to think about, if you like, managing the patient so reproductively they have optimum fertility later on. They need to be made aware of the metabolic consequences and the importance of that if their lifestyle is not managed. And I think more patients are reading. I'm certainly getting patients who bring that up to me before I've even had a chance to talk to them about it. So I think that's happening in the community and be aware of managing the psychological aspects. And the guideline has a lot to say. These are very easy words to sort of mutter. Education, self-empowerment, multidisciplinary care. I mean, that all sounds great. How do you translate that? into general practice where you have limited resources and very limited time and resistant patient. And I don't know the answer to that any more than you do, but trying to give it some thought and being aware of the psychosocial symptoms. Um, now, just in terms of pharmacological therapy, so this is where guidelines have actually have changed a little bit. So. First-line treatment for just about all of your patients, unless there's a clear-cut contraindication, is going to be a combined birth control pill. And we had the visiting North American expert, Rick Grow out, and he basically said someone should go on the birth control pill and not stop until they're ready to start their family. And that's pretty much what our group would practice. But interestingly, a lot of uh, notice has been taken over some big GP studies from Europe, saying that the safest pills are the sort of low-dose um, uh, levonorgestrel pills. So, and of course, we keep changing at Pharmac. What even those of us that are on the committees who don't know what the um, who don't know what the uh, funded options are. So, things like Ava or Microgyne on twenty and thirty have the lowest risk of any cardiovascular or VTE consequences. Now, the problem is that this is not well studied in the PCOS population. So, they've sort of translated from a general population to PCOS population. But that that is the advice in this guideline. I think it would be fair to say two things. One is that there's little data that compares different types of pill and their effect on hair growth and acne um, so and the second thing is every patient that I've got and I do start them on a low dose pill and sometimes we'll, we'll move up to something like Jeanette or Yaz or Yasmin when I run through the patients with these slight differences in VTE and whatever and ask the patient what they'd like to do they all almost invariably, and I suspect Megan would say the same thing, they say, I'm doing better on one of these antiandrogen pills. But I think that's a decision a patient can make after consultation. But this is the guideline, especially when you're beginning the pill for the first time. All right. Interestingly, and you might well be very critical and say, gosh, Stella, every talk you've given us to us in the last five to 10 years, you've said there's little use for, there's little indications for metformin unless you want to think about ovulation. So metformin seems to have come back. Um, and so again, that's been popular, was not popular, and it's popular again. And it is suggested that it could be used alone or it could be used, interestingly, with a birth control pill, particularly if you've got a patient who's got metabolic overtones. So the patient with an adverse family history or perhaps who's overweight, who's got hypertension, dyslipidemia, prediabetes. So that's an interesting change. And Megan, you might be quite interested to hear that. We haven't even yet had a chance to discuss it as our group. 
Um, just very briefly, the change in terms of, of subfertility associated with PCOS is that letrozole, so aromatase inhibitor used um, um, off-label is, um, like many of the medications with PCOS, is, um, is first line rather. That it's not that we won't use clomiphene or metformin, but letrozole has become first line.